John, first of all, thank you. Um, I have to give a word of thanks because a few years ago I watched a conversation that you had and I had uh, read a lot of what you spoke about, but it wasn't in my bones at the time. It was simply words on a piece of paper, something that resonated, but something that I didn't own uh, as, a, as a human being. But after that conversation, something penetrated and that was the first time that something went deep within me um, and it wasn't just words from books that I picked up off a bookshelf. So first thing is thank you for the role that you played in my life at that, at that time. I'm interested to hear that. <laughs> I don't know that I deserve any thanks for it, Alex, but anyway, it's nice of you to say so. Okay, John, you always seem, every time I've, I've listened to you and watched you on YouTube, you always seem in a complete state of equilibrium, a state of complete peace. Can I ask, John, is this, are you always that way? Or are there things that can happen in your life that completely take you off that point? Alex, I'm rather wary of saying yes or no to anything these days, you know. There's an old saying, when we're young, we see things in terms of black and white. Mm. But when you're old, you see things, different shades of grey. So the way I'll answer you is sometimes more or less in a state of equilibrium but not always. But certainly the ups and downs are less so than they used to be when I was younger, much less. Okay, can we, can we talk a little bit about your background in your life uh, as, as you were growing up as a young man? Um, I remember hearing that you were an army officer at one time, worked in the family business. Um, what happened in your life where you sort of uh, moved towards spirituality. Generally speaking, it doesn't happen overnight. It seems to be like a, a progression. Is that something that happened with you? Nothing sudden, Alex, at all. Um, I didn't call it spirit, of course, when I was young, <clears throat> but being a country boy um, in love with farming, um, brought up before the war, or born before the war, in a very rural setting. Uh, I, I hardly knew what another little boy was until I was sent to school at the age of seven. So I, was, I grew up, as, 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 just had an older sister, but she wasn't very interested in me. So I was used to being alone and my and my playmates were the open fields and the, and the animals and the plants that in the country around where I lived. We lived in a very, very rural setting. So it was natural for me to be quiet and alone. And I've always loved the space of the open fields. Well, I never called it, never dreamed of spirit, never heard of spirit in those days, but I've loved those sort of places all my life. Um, if anything, sums up my, in fact, my life, it's don't fence me in. <laughs> and it was only much, much later that I began to put spirit and, and, and space and silent all in the same category, really, because I don't know where one begins and the other ends, really. But um, so, yes, it was just the love of nature, really, that uh, that, that started me off. And then I I, I met a girl when I was 20 and she sort of introduced me to uh, my first philosophic books and I, I tried for her sake to get interested in it, in it but never was really. I must prefer the open fields. And <laughs> I found all that head stuff rather complicated and just got me mixed up too. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm sorry, I can't tell you a dramatic eureka moment. It never happened with me. It was just a long, gradual evolution. But it certainly has evolved, never stopped. Mm. And do you, in your life, has the, 
um, evolution of your inner being, of your consciousness, do you perceive that to be eternally expanding or do you think, um, yes, you do? Oh, absolutely. Yes, it, 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 and I don't really, I don't go along with those who say they've got it or they found it or this sort of thing. I assure you, how do you ever find the infinite? You can't, it just goes on forever. And now in old age, yeah, I assure you, I, I, I've never been more sure that I'm just a spiritual child. I may be just coming at the end of elementary school, <laughs> but mm. it's not the end of it's not the end, yeah. How can you ever, how can you ever say you've found God or found any of these enlightenment or something? <laughs> these things are just <laughs> you may just get a glimpse of, <laughs> get a taste of. <laughs> so at times, have a longer, a longer um, acquaintance with. Yes, you become more familiar with these things and. Um, Yes, you even begin to feel these are your natural home. This is where you belong. But have, you, have you always felt that you belonged in the world, John, or, or have you felt like, because uh, I know from my experience when I was younger growing up, I didn't feel like I fit in oh. to the world. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I'm, I'm the classic misfit, and at least within the world of man. No, mm. as, as a child, um, um, Yes, I very soon got into the into recognizing what I call the art. You know, as a farmer, when chemicals were first uh, introduced into farming, which is all really in within my lifetime, um, they were generally called artificials, and um, and this term was widely used in, in connection with most modern things. Really, artificiality. And then modern design came in and, and modern materials and things. And um, yes, artificial. Artificial uh, contrasted to natural, or rather unnatural and natural. Um, unnatural and natural. Let's expand on that a little bit, because if, if I look at the world today, there seems to be a lot of artificiality. And perhaps that's why. Um, there were so many seeming problems in people's health, mental well-being and everything. I look at why don't people return to the natural world and let's see what may happen. Um, but it seems that we're not moving that direction. Um, and yes, this, this uh, gut reaction, this longing for the natural, yes, it's, in, it's really instinctive in all of us, isn't it? Mm. You know, even the manufacturers try to draw the, uh, a nice cow or some green grass or something to, to, to sell you a, <laughs> you a, a plastic box of something. You know, it's, it's uh, innate longing, isn't it? And uh, look at me, I live in a little flat now, but I've got some in window boxes and I look out of the window at trees. We all love these little signs. Or you want a cat or a dog to stroke. And these things are comforting to everybody. It's a sort of natural instinct in us. Let's, let's go back to belonging then, John. Yes. So you didn't fit in. You, fe you never felt like you fit in. What would you perhaps suggest to people who feel that way? Well, if you want to be more natural, go back to nature. Simple. What, if you live in a city in a high-rise block, well, there's usually a tree somewhere. Um, look at the sky. The sky is a, it's, it's nothing better than to look out of the window. You can usually see a bit of sky somewhere. Mm -hmm. We found that an absolute lifeline, the sky. Mm -hmm. The greatest of comfort. Um, look at the sky. Mm. Don't turn to other people. You won't get anything natural from other people. <laughs> Pe mm. <laughs> uh, we, we, can, we can elaborate on, on what man is and what he isn't. But, yes, please, please go ahead. You want me to go on on this thing? Yes. What, what is man and what isn't man? Well, this is the great, great question, isn't it? And... Um, Depend how you start. There are so many ways of what gets us going. Let's talk. Let's go towards 
ego and uh, the thinking and how overthinking can create our problems? Well, it took me many, many years to, to come to that point. Alex said, and I, I, I took ages to understand what people meant when they talked of the ego. Um, I've got my own, my own um, understanding of it now. I'm not sure everybody will agree, but um, I think for me it was just this gut reaction against artificiality, against um, against the unnatural. Of course, I do, as a young as a as a countryman, um, the city, the town uh, exemplified that. Um, yes, I see. Yes, I that was the this town and country. Country was natural. Town life was unnatural in its in its simplest. Um, I think I soon uh, developed a distaste for for talk, much talk, talkative people. Mm. I never felt comfortable with that. I preferred the silence of. Horses and sheep and cows, and of course the, the plants themselves. So, do you think that the ego of the person, that the cities and the the artificiality, do you think that that is like a reflection of man's ego? Absolutely, yes. Again, this took me many years to to realise this, but um, see, uh, what we have in here is projected outward. And hence the world. Um, the world is what we make it. You know, it's very simple. Uh, think how everybody, uh, everybody's room reflects their preferences, what they're interested in, what they like. The books uh, on your bookshelves reflect what you're interested in. The clothes you are, and and the um, body language, doesn't it, reflects what's inside. So just keep extend that, and uh, you see how the world is what we make it. It's absolutely true, and, uh, and this uh, <coughs> this may come as a as a as a preliminary or a consequence of of uh, a deeper understanding of the ego of what man actually is. I can tell you how it started in me. I remember very clearly, actually. I've told this story often before, so it may not be new to you. But when I had my first farm, I was just 21. So I suppose it was a year or two after that, I remember. I, it's hard to express how much, as a young farmer, I loved the land. Um, an extraordinary bond grows up when you have a piece of land and, uh, and start working on it. And, uh, I, and I suppose it was on a, about this time of year in uh, spring when the grass began to grow and, um, and this wonder of young grass was before my eyes. And I realized I couldn't walk across my fields without my heavy hobnail boots hurting and crushing the grass. Well now, what a lesson, what did that mean? And why, because uh, I say this in all seriousness, um, like most children, I was familiar with fairies and uh, I'd never doubted. Um, I mentioned earlier how I like to, I love the silence of animals and of nature. Well, of course, they're not really silent. They communicate quietly, don't they? Without words, as, as do the fields. Why, is, why do the trees? They all, everything is communicating with us if we've, if we've got the ears to hear, if you listen. It's not exactly, not verbal, but there's this subtler communication. That's right, instinctively, most of us feel at home with nature. We feel companioned by it. Flowers in the window box. Um, yes, so there was I damaging my, my beloved grass. And then I realized I couldn't even breathe without breathing in little 
bugs or insects or things. And every time I, I picked a fruit or something, I was picking, I was killing the, the, the fruit. Later on, I used to grow vegetables. How could I cut the head off a lettuce without killing it? How could I pull a carrot from the ground? I'm destroying life all the time, aren't I? And on my first farm, I had sheep, and goodness me, what do you think it is? You love these creatures, and then you send them off to be killed. Um, and then I began to put two and two together. I thought of Jesus that's called the Lamb of God, that sacrificed for what's called the sins of this world. Well, what does that mean, for heaven's sake? Then I thought, well, these lambs are killed for me, for this clumsy, clumsy creature that can't walk across the grass without damaging it. Why can't I be a fairy? Fairies don't hurt the grass. They sit on the flowers, don't they? And the flowers love them. Now then, in a way, I've been trying to be a fairy all my life, Alex. Why am I this great clumsy lump of flesh? Why can't I just be a fairy or a spirit? Well, I think that's in fact that's really what it's all about, isn't it? How can we live in this lovely world without hurting it? Mm -hmm. And then I began to think more, well, you know, the only problem in this world is me. The number one parasite, number one pollution in this world isn't plastic or the government, it's me. It all starts with me. Well, this again took many, many years to sort of see more clearly what I'm, you know, it's easy to talk about it now, but in those early days, when I was a young, my early 20s, these were very sort of nebulous, vague ideas that came and went. But this is, is really how it started. Um, on one of my books, I, I start off from the back cover. How can I best serve? That's the word, service. How can I best serve this world I love? <clears throat> this was my question. And the answer came, the answer came, the answer led him deeper into prayer. Well, prayer, again, is a big subject. I could elaborate on that. It's really the process of, of uh, turning to spirit of raising consciousness from, from, from the death and mortality, which is this flesh that, as Jesus says, profiteth nothing, is dust, and goes to dust, and spirit, which is, of course, the eternal spirit that, that doesn't die. Here you have death, and here you have spirit. Because if the average person would say prayer, I think they would think about asking for things yeah. whereas well, i don't think you mean prayer like that do you all these spiritual religious terms alex they they all start from the realm of separation hmm? because the ego the number one feature of the set of the ego is that it is separate it, it produces a separate identity called me look i'm john and you're alex Two separate beings, two separate creatures. <clears throat> Whereas when you come into spirit, what we, what, we, what are we talking about? Let's say silence. Hmm? Silence, if we both stop talking, there's one silence that holds us, contains us both. Hmm? Doesn't matter whether you're in London or, or California or where you are, there's one silence that contains us both. Now, silence is the threshold of spirit. So it's easy. Here you have separation, two, called duality, and here you have one. And the process of the whole spiritual journey is really a journey from separation to unity. And that's, as you said, easily to say. Yes. And, but yes. the process isn't quite as easy as talking like that. I think this is why, why the most merciful God gives us 80 odd years of fumbling around <laughs> <in the world laughs> to try to, to try to 
<laughs> I don't ever say realize it, but to move in that direction. Yes. And what role do you think that suffering has on that journey? Oh, suffering is most important because, you see, it helps to teach us. Um, again, let's put it very simply. If you think of putting your finger on a hot stove, <laughs> now then, let's see. we learn by our mistakes. Uh, suffering illustrates um, that we are not at home, that we're, we're exiles in this, in this uh, fallen estate called sin, which is really absence from the presence of one, absence from the presence of God. And this is why, look at me, I'm, I'm, I'm soon, I'll soon die. My body's full of aches and pains and all these sort of things you get in old age. This is, this is what I am not. See, fairies don't have these problems, do they? And then if you sort of come into more, if you like, grown-up terminology here, spirit doesn't. Spirit doesn't die. Mm -hmm. So suffering is a consequence, you see, a consequence of sin. Not sin in the cultural context of doing bad things. Well, it, it, you see, what do we mean by it? Um, you know, one can't really avoid getting into these... Um, traditional uh, um, explanations. But if I may take you back uh, um, to the way the Bible explains it, you see, that in the beginning, first of all, man was singular, wasn't he? One man, Adam, just one, in paradise, walked with God. And then, uh, because he chose to go his own way, he fell. He fell in consciousness. He fell from this, from here, down, into separation. And hence, me and God, or me and you, and you and me may agree on some things, but in others we don't. And so the whole Pandora's box of, of division, separation, like this, like black and white, good and bad, came into being. That is the root of, of what we call suffering. At the, root of, at the root of all evil, yes, and suffering, yes. So what, John, of ambition and desire, and if we use an American term, one's pursuit of their own happiness? Well, this is all ego. Mm. I mean, it's, look, it's so easy just to throw that out, but my God, it's, it's real enough when you're in it, isn't it? I, I, I've lived with this. God, God knows you don't, uh, you can't shake this off that easily. Um, even if, even if you look at a newborn baby, which which seems relatively free of these things, he jolly soon starts to pick them up, doesn't it? Yeah. I want them. This is mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here's uh, <laughs> start very early and of course it's the world the world encourages it the world is this is this is what the world is and the world educates us in this in this uh, understanding and it, 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 it um, you know the world is the blind leading the blind that's what it's all about so we will fall ever deeper into the pit the bottomless pit. Hence, well, some, some, some have the motivation to at least try to get out. Um, others less so. Do you think that's through an act of their own volition? Or do you think it's through grace? Oh, 
well, now then, how should I know? Perhaps a bit of both. Most of these things are grace, you see. Um, there's a sort of magnetism from one. There's a, there's a very good, a good description of love. Love is the power of one. It's a sort of magnetism, an attraction, if you like. And um, if you ask people what do they really, really want, it's interesting what people will say. Um, it's not usually the superficial things. It's usually something like peace. Very often love, freedom. A return to the natural state. Natural state. Yeah, it's interesting that you can't actually describe any of these things, can you? They're beyond description. And yet everybody knows what they are. You can't put them in a little box and say, it's this. Can you? Really? Um, so there's a sort of inner compass in all of us that yearns for this. For some it's strong, some it's not so strong. And this would will connect with this magnetism of the one that is radiating out. You know, in biblical terms, it's God's calling us. God calls and some respond and some less so. Some respond strongly. And then starts the long, long journey of facing all the contrary forces. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil being the ego, of course. And um, it's a long, long struggle. Mm. It doesn't have, you know, any fool can know it in theory, say I'm this or that, but, uh, but it's, it's a lifetime journey. And even then, who can say they're fully home? John, who have been uh, big influences in your life? Well, <clears throat> I can't really point to a list of names, Alex. I, I've never been a follower of man. Um, as a boy, I loved the sort of pioneering stories. Um, cowboy stories before they became more violent. And, uh, you know, when they were more romantic uh, ideals, really, than the violence it is today. Um, no, I think nature has always been my primary teacher. Yeah. Beautiful answer. Can we talk about surrender and letting go of maybe desire again and that contracted energy? Well, <clears throat> I learned to make, I, when I was 20, 26, I, uh, I'd, uh, I, I, I looked for someone to teach me to meditate. At that time, I only ever found there was long before internet, of course, in the Middle East, a multitude of gurus are available now. I only ever found one place that was in London. So I had to go down to London to be taught. And I attended the School of Meditation in London for many years, nearly 20 years I attended it. And uh, it was very well taught. And at one stage, um, this phrase, letting go, was introduced. Of course, like all these things, I didn't know what it was. I tried to figure out for a long time. Um, <laughs> I suppose, <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, when you learn to ride a bicycle, how difficult it is at first. Yeah. And then, after a while, something happens, you sort of forget to try and suddenly you find you can do it. I think letting go is a bit like that. The more you try to let go, the more you, you get muddled up and can't do it. And then I thought of 
of uh, then I'd come home from London. I, I'd go out to my fields and and suddenly it's just natural. It just happens, doesn't it? If, if you all screwed up in your head and you go out for a walk, take the dog out for a walk, it'll happen naturally. You'll just get more interested in something else, won't you? Interested in just being where you are. And then, uh, then you'll forget about it. So it's like all these exercises, it's really just as simple as pie, it's just uh, being natural. So, um, because the, the way meditation works, perhaps this might be interesting to bring this in, is that they give you a, in my case, I was given a mantra mm. and told to repeat this mantra. Well, what happens you start off repeating this mantra and then in come thoughts, of course, because mm. the mind's full of thoughts. And then I was told to, to, to let go the thoughts and turn to the mantra. Well, eventually I, eventually I got the knack of doing that. And then you can let go by having an alternative, a more attractive alternative. That's, that's how to do it. You just get interested in something else and it'll, let, it'll happen naturally. You see, letting go is, is best described like this. You just let go. Well, if I've got a worry, for example, you're holding on to the worry. I'm, I'm worried. You're going round and round. And then you suddenly look out the window. And what happens? Well, you see. Because... Uh, uh, our trouble is we get attached to something and our attention is on something. And the more you think about it, the bigger it gets. This is the classic thing. The, the more you, you dwell on your troubles or the more you look at, 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 uh, at horrible images on the internet or something, the bigger they get. And actually they tend to do dominate you, dominate your behavior. And of course the world you project, this is how it all starts. And, um, and if you can just turn away, this is why looking out the window is such a good exercise. Look, there's a wind blowing this morning. I can see the, the lovely leaves billowing in the wind. You see, and in that moment, I forget about all these horrible things. They just disappear like, a, like when you wake up from a bad dream. They just, what happens? They just disappear. Because they're not as real as you think they are. Yes, it's transitory. It's transitory, yes, and it, it, it actually exists in here. And you simply, uh, yes, it, it, stop thinking about it and you'll find it just dies out mm. naturally. Uh, when I do a bit of work with people and they, if I say to them, um, just stop thinking about it or just surrender to it or, or whatever phrase, very often they struggle to do that because it's just words to them. Yes, yes, yes. yes. But when... When something is suggested, such as um, that there is not a hair out of place in the entire cosmos, mm -hmm. everything is absolutely perfectly ordained, as it were. Correct, yes. When one sees the world like that, surrendering seems to become a natural act. It's not something you need to suggest anymore. It's something that becomes natural to the person. Yes. Yes, very good. Um, <clears throat> one thing I've learned, uh, really, again, uh, late in life, is I'm, I'm, I'm very wary of words like stop or don't or should or could or any of these compulsive words. But if you look at the sky, which is a very good uh, sort of symbol of God. The sky doesn't say these things to us, does it? And the sunlight, it's total allowance, isn't it? The rain falls equally on the good and the bad. Non-judgmental. Non-judgmental, you see. And, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> You see, many, many hard lessons I've learned see, to, to reach the point of, of that non-judgmental, no compulsion. I, 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 if I find my, uh, the words like any sort of instructive word coming out of my mouth, I usually regret it, or if I, if I catch it in time, I'll shut up. Yeah. 
You see, that this is not the way, the true way. The true way is like this. Don't learn arms. Mercy. I see this in the uh, personal development and, and the personal development industry and even the spiritual marketplace now, where people suggest to do things <laughs> rather than encouraging curiosity. Yes. They're told what to do, and then that causes more problems, like when you mentioned the philosophy books, and then your mind goes everywhere. That's what I tend to find happening in the world today. The better word is lead, lead, you see. Or by example, the best teacher is example. When I was a young man, in, uh, I went out to South America at one point, I was full of idealism. I wanted to make the world a better place. And uh, I tried, not very really successfully. And at one point, uh, I was sitting alone on a mountain side. And something seemed to say to me, to make whole, be whole. And although I didn't understand it, I've been trying to understand it all my life. It's been a wonderful um, principle for me to make whole be whole. And do you want the world to be any different from what it is today, even with everything that's going on? Well, my dear, <laughs> Want. <laughs> That's another word I don't like. <laughs> but you want, in a way, the motivation for for both of us, I suspect, why we do why we're involved in this work and this interview is because we both uh, want to make the world a better place. But uh, but uh, to begin that, uh, we have to stop criticizing it, judging it. And if we are blessed to reach the point of understanding where, as you say, every hair of the head is perfect, every grain of dust is perfect in its place. And furthermore, every thought in the human mind, however, apparently it seems, it seems bad, is actually a, the consequence of law. The whole world is governed by law, you see, um, <clears throat> just as See, as Adam, the first man, fell from paradise into duality, and hence this, uh, this uh, multitude of complication we call the world. See, it's all the consequence of, of being in the wrong place, not being at home. A lost sheep, with the blind leading the blind. So, uh, so. You know, of course, we do get upset by these things, wars and that, viruses and that, but uh, it's totally lawful and no one to blame but me. And what can we do about it? Well, if you want to help the world to make whole, be whole. You have to begin starting putting yourself in the right place. And then, marvellous to say, again, the words of Jesus to the pure, all things are pure. And you know, one of the marvelous things about being, I won't say pure, I, never, I wouldn't dare claim to have a pure heart, but perhaps being a little bit less impure, in other words, less obsessed with myself, less ego, which is really the, what's meant by impurity, is the ego, me, 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 I, me and mine. If there's a bit less of that, you see less evil out there. The world becomes as ever less, um, ever less dark. Yeah, you see the world as you are. You see the world as it is, and, and, and ultimately, and in your better moments, you may get glimpses of even seeing it in perfection. Extraordinary thing, but it is. And if you could have told me that as a young man, when I was desperately unhappy about the world, and particularly the state of nature, um, mm. or if any a young man was tormented, I was by these questions. 
And now you see I can sit here quietly in front of you and talk like this. Mm. Incidentally, we see that those young man's tears that tormented uh, God knows, you know, all the, the, the despair and the, the, the depression, the anger that, that surged through me as a young man. You see, all were necessary parts of the learning process. That's why I, I can't dismiss them. I've been violent. There's nothing I haven't done in this life. But all the bad things of the things we don't like in other people, there's hardly anything I haven't been guilty of myself. And, and I don't say guilty in a bad way. I, I say because it's because these are lessons that we have to go through. And 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 if there's one achievement in life, I won't. I don't even sure if I dare use the word achievement because I think it's something that grows in you. See, the more mistakes you make. The, the more you realize, I do not know, and I cannot actually do anything, it leads you on to this blessed state of humility. And honestly, there's nothing more important when you stand at the end of life, as I am now, than to uh, feel this humility. Can we maybe move into death uh you've mentioned that you, you 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 believe to be at the end near the end of your life do you feel it's important to have have a relationship with maybe even life in order to accept one's immort uh, one's mortality or seeming mortality Not sure how to answer that one. Um, of course, I'm connected with life. How can I not be? Um, but what I do see very clearly now is that uh, I don't really connect or disconnect or these things. Just as we grow up out of childhood. How does that happen? What happens to the child? You become a schoolboy, don't you? And then what happens? You pass through your school days and pass out into the world. You could say the real school of life begins. Then you mature, go, become middle-aged, peak of your activities and things. And, the start of the long decline. So what happens to all these intermediate stages? You just grow out of them, don't you? And then as we were talking about letting go. It's not so much that I let go of them, and they just, you just grow out of them, literally. And, um, and now in old age, I, I, it's not really that I'm doing anything, but the world is just dying out of me. I'm just the same. I don't do anything, but the body dies out of me. There you are. I don't die. The body, the flesh, mortality, dies out of me. I'm just growing out of it. It's not so much I'm growing, I'm not changing. The, 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 the true being it doesn't change at all, doesn't mature, because it's eternally never the same. Like this silence, this, you see, silence is a very, very good um, indication of spirit. Silence, space, presence, they're all really the same thing, aren't they? Um, but this silence doesn't change a bit. It's not subject to time and space. It's just eternal, eternal life, eternal pure consciousness. But the body, because it's uh, set absent from the source of life, which is this, so it's got a 
uh, a duration, a natural built-in duration, which, which wears out. I don't know, I'm just, I used to be such a strong young man. I could lift anything, do anything. Now I look at you. You lose your muscle mass. Everything just wears out. That's a very <clears throat> evolved way of uh, seeing the world. Uh, the, the average person fears death like it's... <clears throat> that's essentially, in my, from my experience, that's pure ego. The ego doesn't want to let go of... No. Well, again, we can't grow up before we're ready, Alex. This is a great mistake. And why, again, I'm, I'm very shy of compulsion, you see. I'm not, if you try to grow up too soon, you tend to f fall over. In fact, what will happen, you would tend to build up this ego of, oh, look what I've achieved, I've become enlightened or something, before you're ready. You make a fool of yourself. Um, <clears throat> I was farming, it was very good. It taught me patience in these things, um, that there's a time for everything. Um, time to be young, a time to be old. Mm. Yes, of course, uh, when you're young, you don't want to die. You're young and beautiful, your life's full of promise. <laughs> but eventually, uh, you know, the, you lose your beauty, your, your strength and beauty, that's one sure thing, beauty fades, unfortunately. <laughs> or perhaps fortunately, because otherwise we'd never move on to something better, would we? True. Because however beautiful this world is, I assure you, it's only a shadow of the real beauty of that origin, origin, original paradise, which is spirit. You begin to get a taste of that, my dears, and, and what's happened to the world won't seem so terrible. See, in the real world, nothing dies. Death isn't as real as it seems. These are just monsters, monsters that manifest as, well, just that, monsters. Have you had um, experiences in this lifetime here that we could consider mystical experiences? Well, many, 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 yes, I think so. Mm. Could, you, could you give us an example of a couple of them? Well, I couldn't talk like this, could I, otherwise? No, you couldn't, no. Okay. I've heard I heard one about the I believe you lost your farm. Yes. Ah, yes, that's a nice little example. <laughs> I wouldn't quite describe it that as a mystical experience, but it was a step in that direction. Yes, my uh, I, uh <clears throat> at one time uh, my family <clears throat> went through uh, financial difficulties and um, and I had to sell my first farm which really broke my heart at the time. I was, uh, how old was I? I was in my uh, late twenties then, not so late, 26 or seven. And um, I had a flock of sheep at that time. No, I was older than that, never, never mind. Um, yes, I had a flock of sheep, about a hundred odd sheep, which I loved, loved, loved so much. So absolutely. Lovely. And uh, and to see these uh, lovely creatures being sold was, was very tragic for me. Um, but I drove away, uh, went off to visit a friend in another part of the country, and went over some hills, and um, I stopped at a lay-by somewhere, and there was another flock of sheep there. I was looking at these, and suddenly realised that I could love all sheep. And that in losing what I called my flock of sheep, I could then love all sheep. And there was a freedom in that, and that love simply expanded. Now, what a lesson that was, you see, that the less I have to call mine, the more, the more I have. In losing that we gain, so it's a blessing to lose. But of course, at the time, it's dreadfully painful, dreadfully, dreadfully painful, tragic. The end of life, isn't it? What, what have I got left to live for? And then you open up to a greater, a greater work. 
And this has been happening all my life, and I suspect it is in most people's lives, really. Um, and then I had a second farm, and then a time came when I had to lose my second farm. Well, and uh, gradually had to realize that I could then love the greater world. And that love that was nurtured in this cradle of my first own first farm, then realized that the whole universe is my farm. So love became universal. But step by step by step, through many tears, had to be torn from what I loved to love them all. There's an old word is being purged, you see, we have to be purged of, of me, purged of my ideas, my everything, and above all my, pr my pride, this idea that I am something. What am I? Nothing. Mm. And then we begin to merge with the infinite. And that, and that seems to me to be true humility, not just a word, but one's complete surrender to love or freedom. Or... Yes, well, it, 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 again, you see, it's no achievement of mine. It's just natural. It's what happens naturally. But I do, uh, I do, um, uh, 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 I do give credit to meditation because this has been a, uh, I've meditated for nearly 60 years, night and morning, hardly, hardly missed one. It's been an absolute um, uh, cornerstone of, of my life. And um, see, the, the meditation is, is this, it's letting go. And although often I sit there, I'm bored, I just want to go home or something. Um, it's, it's often nothing seems to happen you wonder what you're doing um cumulatively it it, uh, it it what it does it, it opens up to what's beyond so you it, there's no letting go is not really a painful process because it, you turn to something preferable something better i told you i love that that principle don't fence me in well you see this is our normal human state, you see, me holding on to my ideas and this. And then when you meditate, you do this, and you just, it gets bigger. It's like looking out of the window. This is, you come back to me, my life, my troubles. So to me, that's preferable. Some people love this. Some people are afraid of this. Oh, I don't like it. I like to be. I like to be me, my own human rights, and you know, <laughs> self self development, and you know, <laughs> me and my. This is this is their reality. That's what they want. That's what some people do really. Well, perhaps I was blessed, fortunate, and that I've always been like this. <laughs> I think there's a there's a wonderful author called Robert Johnson. He was a, a Jungian a psychoanalyst, and he said, I'm paraphrasing, something like, if you don't go towards spirit, spirit will come towards you. Well, um, the sky does, doesn't it? The sky is beaming down on us all the time. It doesn't actually come anywhere. It's just not, it's never been absent. Look, spirit, where is spirit, dear? <laughs> Everywhere. We're in it like fish is in the sea. Mm -hmm. How can the sea come to the fish? We're already in it. I know a lot of the old religious hymns talk about come, Holy Spirit, come. But how can it come? It's already here. We're in it. This is what we are. Look, you really got to look in anybody's eyes. However dulled and negative they are, there's usually a glimmer of something behind all that. What is light? Light is spirit, isn't it? But it's all the same. I am the light of the world, says Jesus. So, um, see, what we have to do in the process of, of meditation is really we, we just work at the impediments. It's a matter of letting go the blockages.
blockages that stand between. And the blockages are simply what we're holding on to, like this, you see. It's not, not much light inside my fist, is there? It's dark. In fact, if you want another illustration, open your mouth, look inside. What's there? It's dark, isn't it? Yeah, we're dark. It's all dark inside. You come out of this and you, you're in the light. I think some people have the idea that meditation is just like an Eastern thing and it's there to escape from reality. <laughs> I don't, I completely disagree with that, but I've heard that said to me countless times. Well, yes, indeed, me too. When I started to meditate, it, meditation was hardly known here in the West. And, uh, and uh, a lot of people were very suspicious of that. Primarily the church was dead against meditation. And, um, and, and uh, I mean, my father thought of me just opting out, just this mystical nonsense. Uh, you know, why don't you do something useful? I've been sitting in our local church for 25 years meditating, and, uh, and I felt if people haven't said it to me directly, they certainly thought it, why don't you do something? <laughs> why don't you get up and feed the hungry or something like this? What's the use of meditation? Well, there you are. That's how most people, most people see it, probably. It's now becoming fashionable. So, so it's sort of the in thing to do now, isn't it? So, but it's taken a long time for it to become accepted. Because um, you can charge a lot of money for it now, John. That's well, why. Well, that's, uh, that's what happens, I'm afraid. You know, one of the principles that I was taught as a young man at the school was that, um, that nobody... Um, it receives any personal gain from this work. So um, that's what I've tried to practice all my life. But I know there are people now who, who are making personal gain from it and uh, well, God will judge. God will judge. You see, how can you... Do you know, <clears throat> again, it seems hardly, hardly imaginable, but when I was a young man, farming was r really regarded more as a way of life than a way of, than commercial. It was a self, it was largely self sufficiency, and um, what was the money you made out of it was almost secondary. It was a way of life, and it was a way of life. And then it began to become commercial, particularly after the war, and uh, and now. That's everyone accepts it. It's money making business. Oh, you see, why was it? Why was that considered immoral? Because the land doesn't really belong to anybody, doesn't it? The land is a gift, like the sunshine, like water, like the sky. Why, why should one take personal gain from it, personal advantage, profit? Yes, we all partake in its goodness like the birds and the bees do. But to, but to uh, profit for the benefit of the ego, this is very questionable. So even more to take, uh, to make profit out of spiritual work is, uh, well, as I say, God will judge. And God mm. is the judge. And, 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 uh, <clears throat> and, um, this is a great comfort, I find, if you can accept that, that within this imperfect world, there is this perfect law operative, then you begin to understand why things are as they are. That's a cause and effect. And everything is judged. And, and uh, as we sow, so shall we reap. This is the law. So why do we get, why do we have all these, these, uh, these misfortunes in the world come back to me to make whole be whole. Mm. Mm. And if we're looking into the world today, John, um, we've already said that, you know, there's by even having this conversation, there must be some will there to try and make it a better place somehow. Um, but as you said, it starts with you. 
the responsibility that we have as an individual, um, to what degree do you feel that expressing that to other people and expressing that through the internet is a worthwhile cause? Do you think that there's, it's worth doing or do you think that people are on their own path and there is no need to interfere? Well, Alex, I'm not really here by choice, even willingly. Uh, when I was first approached five years or so ago to be interviewed, uh, I, I, I didn't even know what internet was, let alone YouTube. And I didn't want, I was asked to go down to London. I didn't want to go to London, of course, so I refused. So uh, they came up here and interviewed me. The first time I'd ever been interviewed and, um, and I didn't really know what it was all about at all. And then it appeared on something I then discovered was called YouTube and uh, to my surprise it was well received and uh, and then uh, another chap called Phil turned up and uh, and uh, said let's make some some more so uh, well I agreed and uh, so I've become well known but it's not it's not exactly what I've ever wanted. It's certainly what I ever visualized. And it all happened in extreme old age, the last thing. I was always a very quiet, unknown, sort of unseen, unknown figure in life. And, and I was well content with that. And, um, and now it appears that I've been thrust into the limelight. Um, Have you always wanted to be that way, Jim? I, I, like I, hidden? I, hmm? Have you always wanted to be like hidden and, and away from society? Is that the way you've always in your nature? Yes, I yes, I I think it was natural for me to be like that. Yes, I'm a naturally quiet man. Um, never talked much. Um, and, 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 and uh, yeah, and sorry, after five years or so of being a public figure, I I'm only too willing now to withdraw and uh, and uh, become quieter. Um, just as to, you see, the very really important thing that one comes to realize in life is that spirit, this invisible presence, you see, this thing that you can see with your eyes of flesh, this body is dying. Primary fact, this is mortality. This is dying out. You imagine on the screen, just imagine at the end, just imagine this goes down, 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 down into the grave. And what is left? Just the emptiness of this room. But the room isn't empty, it's filled with silence, isn't it? The voice, the, the sight of this body has sunk away. And we're left with this silence. Now, this silence is eternal, isn't it? This is spirit. Now, you come to realize, the more you become acquainted with spirit, and the more you grow out of this, you realize that the real operative force in this life is not me, but spirit. This is the power behind the throne, you see. This is the steam in the engine. This is the energy, this is the energizing force that, that produces the, what, what the world calls energy, the puff, puff, puff of, of life. Um, so all this work of influencing the world is really ultimately the work of spirit. And this is really uh, at its best a via, an instrument and that it's more normally an obstacle. You see, so the less of me, the better. The less of me, the more of God. And, and you see, it happens completely naturally. We, we have our time of when we're young, we do things physically, then we use our mind more. I've used my voice, all right. I've had five years of, of public speaking and that. And, ooh, maybe it's come to an end or it's coming to an end. And then I'm entirely 
are more than willing for it to end because because this spirit you see is a is 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 really now God is well described as almighty isn't he see? this is this has no strength at all. Look at it now at the end of life. It's just nothing but weakness. Whereas this is almighty, all knowing, all compassionate, all understanding. This is everything that's needed. This is, maybe just look at my hand in a sense, it's the instrument of, of my mind, isn't it? I say to my hand, pick up this mouse or something and pick it up. And so this is really an instrument, this, this embodiment, both physical and mental, because mind is just an instrument also, are just uh, instruments of this the spirit. So it has its day, it has its natural function. I've, I've had a little long life, now it's tired, it's time to go home and merge back into that from which it comes which is spirit. And it's spirit that is the consciousness that, that, that uh, enlivens, which is really is the, the functioning operator in life. Mm -hmm. So you may trust, and we're told to trust God, and then trust becomes really, um, trust is really higher knowledge, you see. This is knowledge, it, knowledge is limited. Mm -hmm. The wisdom of man is foolishness to God. But um, faith or, or, or trust is really higher knowledge, is higher understanding. Then this becomes the reality, and this just becomes the, 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 the limitation, the instrument. Yeah, the more knowledge that, as a young man, I, I tend to consume, the more it leads me to a place of not knowing anything. Right, correct. Yes, that's right. Very good. And the more that you try and put on to yourself, the more that you need to get rid of again. That's right. That's right. Not get rid of it. It'll, it'll die out naturally when right. you find something better. You, see. you grow out of it. But yes, we, 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 we all accumulate knowledge when we're young because it seems the right thing to do. Probably is. Just a phase of life. How would we? How would we ever? How would we ever see the vanity of it if we didn't indulge it? What does a day before we wrap up? What is a day for John Butler? What does that look like? Well, I don't always rise from my bed with joy. <laughs> Life isn't very easy when you are old. Um, well, old age has its problems. I live alone. I have to cope with cope with things. Yeah, the body is unwilling to. Everything yeah, gets difficult. Getting dressed, I have to be careful. I don't fall over. I lose my balance very easily. Now I have to hold on to things. I can't put my trousers on without sitting down. All these things take time. I have to be careful. I go out to, up to the church. I have to walk on two sticks. I have to hold on to the banister very carefully. I have to go down two flights of steps. And I always think, my God, if, if I fall here, that's be the end of me. I have to be very careful. <laughs> it's a good, good exercise in being, in, in being attentive. When I get down the steps, thank God, that's just another. <laughs> so I've got to walk up to the church, and that's quite an effort. I have to stop and get my breath back. Oh, everything's difficult. It's difficult to turn the key in the lock as my hands are arthritic now. And my fingers have lost their strength. Everything's an effort. Come back, and then the day goes on. <laughs> I've always got correspondence. There you see, it's just a matter of coping with things. But I try to, I try to be present as much as I can. And in my better moments, I, I feel this silence, which is stillness, you see, which is presence, which is spirit. And then I, 
I look at this old man, you know, oh dear, I'm driven mad by the computer. I can't do anything on it. And I just don't know what things to press and what to do. And things go on the screen and God knows it drives me mad. <sighs> Wish I didn't have one, but I may live without one these days. So um, that's a day, dear. Do, do you up. still meditate every day yeah. still? Oh, absolutely. That's why I go out in the church every morning. Yes, I go up and sit in the local church there. I've got my little corner. Yes, I do that. And then I go up again in the late afternoon to meditate again. Yes, that's what keeps me going, really pulls me through the days. I try to sort things out so that when I go, uh, things are left in order. It's not so easy. My mind is slow and nothing works really very well these days. It doesn't seem to matter very much now. What matters is, is this really. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank God is strong. And for that, I'm, I'm so, so thankful that I started this work. This is what the School of Meditation called it, the work of the capital W, this work of meditation when I was a young man because it's this many, many years of practice that enable me to speak with such confidence as I do now. Mm. So if I leave a message for you and anybody who cares to watch this video, it's to practice, practice, practice. Lifelong practice. Practice, as the old saying goes, practice makes perfect. Yeah. John, I've... Uh... I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for all the work that you've done over, well, the, your entire life, but particularly the last five years as you've come into the, the public eye. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you for your very helpful questions and uh, God bless you all. And God bless you too. Thank you, John. <laughs>